Or God, we thank you for men and women like Habakkuk who stand in the breach and uh, foretell your word, oftentimes when it's very uncomfortable to do so. And at the same time, not always understanding what you're up to and why. And that's where we find ourselves a lot of the time as well, Lord. And that's where faith comes in. The great verse, uh, the just shall live by faith, not by legalistic, legalistically keeping your laws, not by understanding everything that's going on in the world, but by knowing you and loving you. And through that personal relationship with you, trusting you enough to know that even when it looks like you don't care, when it looks like you're not fair, when it looks like sometimes you're not even there, you are. That you're a God of grace and mercy at work in and through even the minutest of events, weaving all of this toward your perfect plan for our salvation and the redemption of the entire creation. Lord, may we never just have a little myopic picture of you in our lives, but help us like a back that enables us to be to see the big picture that your hand is always on the helm, that your plan will never be thwarted, and that you invited us to be an integral part of that plan, out of your grace, your love, and your mercy extended to us through Jesus Christ. We make our prayer in his name. Amen. Well, Habakkuk's kind of heavy, you know, you've been dealing with the Odyssey and the problem of evil, so I thought I'd lighten us up a little this morning. Uh, one of my friends sent me uh, this from uh, Highland Park, Brazil, Dallas, some astute observations. There are two sides to every divorce yours and that losers. <laughs> the closest I ever got to a 4.0 in, in college was my blood alcohol content. <laughs> I live in my own little world, but it's okay. Everyone knows me here. <laughs> I saw a very large woman wearing a sweatshirt with guess on it. I said, left tackle? <laughs> I don't do drugs. I find I get the same effect just by standing up really fast. <laughs> I don't like political jokes. I've seen too many get elected. <laughs> if life deals you lemons, make lemonade. If life deals you tomatoes, make Bloody Marys. <laughs> Shopping tip. You can get shoes for a buck at the bowling alley. <laughs> Every day I beat my previous record of consecutive days I've, been, I've stayed alive. No one ever says it's only a game when their team wins. Ever notice that people who spend money on beer, cigarettes, and lottery tickets are always complaining about being broke and not feeling well? I'll just skip this next one. Marriage changes passion. Suddenly you're in bed with a relative. <laughs> Why is it that most nudists are people you don't want to see me? <laughs> Snowmen fall from heaven unassembled. Uh, <laughs> I signed up for an exercise class. I was told to wear loose-fitting clothing. If I had any loose-fitting clothing, I would have the class. Don't argue with an idiot. People watching may not be able to tell the difference. <laughs> when you know it, brain cells come and brain cells go, but fat cells live forever. <laughs> Why is it that our children can't read a Bible in school, but they can in prison? So those are some astute observations about life. Well, in, our, in our, our last two times together, um, we're looking at Habakkuk's prayer in chapter 3. So it probably would be good to back up a little bit and revisit some things that we've already said about 
about prayer in, in this class, uh, but to do so in the spirit of uh, shigonioth. That's a Hebrew word. You may have seen it up there in verse 1. It said that uh, this, this prayer of Habakkuk um, should be uh, done, prayed in the spirit of shigonioth. Well, we're not sure exactly what that means, um, but uh, it was probably a, a usable term. Uh, we do know that it can mean, in Hebrew, a, a song that is passionately sung. And Habakkuk's prayer is not only a, a, a prayer, it's also considered to be a psalm. If you look at the psalms, that was the Hebrew hymn book. And uh, the psalms were sung in temple worship. And so were other, there are other psalms elsewhere in scripture, and a lot of commentators believe Habakkuk's prayer is a psalm that was often sung in temple worship. And so this is probably a musical notation saying it uh, should be sung according to, should go to be sung passionately. Um, so uh, in fact, it's a wild, passionate song. That's the literal Hebrew. That ought to say something to you and me about our, our prayers, you know, that our prayers probably should not be along the lines of, now I lay me down to sleep, but ought to be wildly passionate conversations with God. Uh, are we Presbyterian type Christians want to do everything decently and in order and be demure. Um, we need more passion as Presbyterians. Uh, I, I'm made one of the hallmarks of my ministry is trying to produce passionate Presbyterians and uh, to be on fire for who the Lord is and what he's up to. And so think about it. next time you pray, think about what would it mean for me to pray passionately? I don't think it means jumping up and down and going wild. I think it means really just unloading your entire being, your entire heart before God, knowing that he wants you to be intimately and passionately in love with him and uh, involved uh, with this relationship that he's given us. Uh, Habakkuk is a passionate prayer. Uh, his conversation with God, which is what prayer is, is robust and it's animated, it's excited about what uh, he discovers about this almighty God of the universe that he has an intimate relationship with. And really, what Habakkuk says here in this prayer, this prayer is also considered a theophany. A theophany is uh, an encounter with, with God, an overwhelming encounter, uh, usually initiated by God himself. And Habakkuk's prayer is considered also a theophany, uh, but it's, it's more than uh, just that. It's, it's a vision of the majesty and the power and the glory of God, and how he will deal justly with these Babylonian, these Chaldean invaders after uh, he's used them to bring judgment upon Israel. In verse 2, Habakkuk talks about the fear of the Lord. If you saw there, you get this, this great picture there in the midst of his his prayer uh, about his uh, knees knocking. Um, and uh, he, he's, he's terrified is not the right word, but he has, a, I think, a healthy fear of who God is. I told the small group leaders yesterday, that, that's something that we have lacked as the people of God really since the beginning, or maybe about halfway through the 19th century, our foremothers and forefathers in the faith, especially in the Reformed tradition, the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, emphasized a healthy, reverent fear of God. Not a pathological fear. Um, it's a, a, more of a, a fear uh, of the, the the awesomeness you feel when you're in the presence of something that's powerful and wonderful and, and uh, omnipotent. Um, you know, if you if you see a, a uh, volcano uh, and you're not in the midst of it, um, 
you know, there's, there's this awe, this sense of wonder, and, and, and yeah, they don't, you know, you don't want to get too close. Um, but we ought to have that, that fear of God. The, the, the Bible tells us in more than one place, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I think we have too much of a, but we, we've gone the other way too much. We've emphasized the, the imminence of God displayed in Jesus Christ, that you know, he is our friend. He is uh, uh, someone we can get up close to. And in Romans' sermon the other week, I, you know, the Holy Spirit enables you and me to cry out to God, not just Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, but Abba, Daddy. You know, we can crawl into his lap, so to speak, and address him in his intimate terms. But we're never to do that to the extent where we let go of this healthy, Fear that God is the Almighty Creator of the universe, our, our, our Judge and our Redeemer. Um, and as a pastor, I, I, I worry about how that familiarity, maybe too familiar with Christ, bleeds into worship, where we come into a sanctuary or fellowship hall on a Sunday morning with such a casualness and as a matter of factness that we have no more awe uh, of God. We, we don't think and bow before the mystery. Uh, we're too casual. And I'm, I'm preaching to myself here. Um, so I think to cultivate a, a good, healthy, reverent fear of the Lord where we, uh, our knees should knock. If I was invited to Buckingham Palace this afternoon, I'd be a little bit intimidated and nervous to be in the presence of the Queen of England. Um, I wouldn't fear that she's going to kill me, but, I, but her office and her stature, and we ought, God's a zillion times uh, greater than she is, so we ought to have that healthy fear like Habakkuk has. Um, verses 3 through 15 are a great theophany of an encounter between a man and the presence of God. It's a, it's a panorama as to how God's power uh, is displayed over all of nations and all of creation. Uh, in all of this panoply of wrath and fury and power that Habakkuk prays about, of God crushing nations, of having a brightness like the sun, uh, how he's shaking the powers and principalities, uh, displaying wrath against um, Rivers and the sea, of the sun and the moon standing still, as arrows like lightning bolts. In the midst of all of that, did you catch what it's really all about? It's not really about him just flexing his muscles. It's not just about him punishing Israel for its sin by using Babylon with all of its power. It's all about what the whole Bible is about. And that's your and my salvation. Ever since Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve <coughs> knocked their lives out of kilter, knocked the universe <coughs> off its axis with human sin, and I don't begin to be able to tell you that I understand completely how all that works, but I do know this, that right there, this God of unconditional love and grace goes into action. He's not a God of cheap grace. He says, there are consequences. But right away, he says to Adam and Eve, I'm banning you from the garden. But I'm going to pursue you, and I'm going to draw you back to myself. And um, that's the whole story of the Bible, is... Humanity running away from God, kicking God in the teeth, so to speak, and God responding by saying, did you hurt your foot? And uh, I'm going to do everything I can to draw you back to myself, to do what you can't do for yourself. And that's to pay for this sin you've unleashed in the universe, because you couldn't possibly cover all this, but I can and I will through Jesus Christ. And... That is really what Habakkuk is all about. Not just punishing Israel, but he's going to save Israel ultimately. And we've got messianic 
prophecy emerging uh, here in uh, throughout uh, Habakkuk. And so the trajectory of all of Scripture is, is toward our salvation. And that begs the question, okay, um, what is salvation really all about? Well, first of all, it's, it's what we're saved from. We're saved from our own self-destruction. We're saved from the destiny that we have set ourselves toward, which is a destiny in opposite direction from where God is. And if you carry that out, ultimately, that means ultimate separation from God, which is hell. You know, the picture we have of hell, most of us have of hell, you know, the devil and his demons with pitchforks and turning people on spits. On, that is not in Scripture. You know where that comes from? Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno. Uh, in fact, the, Satan and the demonic, they're not in charge of hell. They're not down there running the show. Uh, no, they're going to be the first inmates the Bible says God is in control of hell, not Satan. And uh, have you ever stopped and thought about how many people are in hell right now? Zero. Nobody's in hell. Uh, there hasn't been the judgment yet. Well, where's Adolf Hitler? I don't know. Uh, he's somewhere between <laughs> heaven and hell. Uh, where's my daughter, Anna? Well, she's in paradise. Any believer uh, is in paradise. Jesus turns the thief on the cross and doesn't say, today you will be with me in heaven. Nobody's in heaven right now, except God, his eternal being. Um, so what happens to you and me if we were to die today? Well, I could talk for two hours on the metaphysics of what might happen. Because if, if you die today, you leave time, which is part of creation and go into eternity where it's the ever-present now and so I'm not going to go there it gets it blow your mind but um, it's not as simple as it looks but there one day will be a judgment day and then hell will be populated and scripture says it's going to be at least more than one person there I don't know who's going to be there there's only one person you can be assured that isn't there and that's yourself and you're going to see someday I'm going to be preaching very strongly on uh, how you and I can have an assurance of our salvation. Because that's what Paul talks about in Romans 8, section of the chapter I'll be preaching on. Um, you and I can have that assurance of our salvation. Habakkuk had that assurance of his salvation. It is not arrogant to say, I am assured of my salvation. People will say, that sounds arrogant. Well, it would be if that is not what God wants you and me to have. In fact, it's the height of arrogance to feign humility and say, I'm not sure about what God says. I want you to be sure, sure about it. So um, Habakkuk has this assurance that even in the midst of all of this chaos and evil and sin that's being unre released through Babylon, uh, it's ultimately going to save him and the Israelites from an eternal destiny away from God. And it's going to save them for. See, this is real important. We're not only saved from something, we're saved for something. But what are you and I saved for? Well, in this temporal life, you and I are saved for a humble servanthood of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the world, to be little prophets. Remember Jordan Ford when I was down on St. Mary, they're, they're out on TV, home of the little prophet. Uh, had a guy with a turban on. That was their little logo. But you and I are to be little prophets. Not run around foretelling the future, but remember the major role of a prophet is to foretell the word of God to the immediate situation, to the people that are involved in that situation. So um, you and I are to be spokeswomen and spokesmen for Jesus. Another way of saying that is our little mission statement. We're to make Jesus visible and audible uh, to those around us. And so your, your role in many ways is no different than that of the prophet Habakkuk. We're saved uh, 
to be Christ's hands and feet. All the things this church does in the inner city of San Antonio and across this nation and around the world, that's all done out of spirit, out of a spirit of humble servanthood. Um, so we're saved for that, but then we're also saved for eternal life with Christ. And by the way, that doesn't begin at death. It begins the moment you accept Christ. Because it's not just about an unending life, although it's, that's part of it. But eternal, the word Iona in Greek, means not only uh, never ending, but it, it, it's reflective of a, of a quality of life. So when Christ comes into your life, the quality of your life ratchets up infinitely. And uh, that's a life you and I know now. And hopefully, as we get older, that quality is getting better as our relationship with Christ deepens. And we get honed more and more toward the likeness of Christ. But it's all about our, our salvation. God is always throughout Scripture about uh, the task of saving a faithful remnant. Um, and... Uh, in our culture today, which is speedily heading away from any kind of biblical morality, you and I are going to be more and more the faithful remnant. We better get used to that. I grew up in Christendom in the 1950s, 60s. I've said this in here before. I like that. I grew, I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, outside Washington, D.C. The president was a Presbyterian, Dwight Eisenhower, only president ever baptized in office. My Dr. Elson, who's the brother of our, uh, Mr. Elson here in the church, and Dr. Elson was a pastor of National Pres at the time he baptized Eisenhower. And every year, Congress began first at the National Presbyterian Church with the service of Holy Communion. And if you were a Jew, an atheist, a Buddhist, you went, you may not have taken communion, and the front page of the Washington Post the next day after that was Dr. Elson shaking hands with whoever was present, <coughs> Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Eisenhower. And growing up as a kid in a Presbyterian church where the president's Presbyterian, gosh, Congress doesn't start without us, Presbyterians saying it can. Um, that felt real good. That was Christmas. That's all gone. That's all gone. If you try to get Congress to go into any church today, good luck. Good luck. So um, we're, we're more and more of a remnant. We're not in charge anymore. Uh, don't come to me and say, what we need you, Ron, is elect Christians, president and all the senators and Congressmen. Um, yeah, I don't. I, we tried that. We're now back into the first century for the first time since the first century. The good news is that the Christians in the first century lived such an alternative lifestyle to the surrounding culture, which we had a pluralistic religious flavor, many gods and goddesses, sexual anarchy was reigning rampant, little respect for life, there was euthanasia, infanticide, um, you know, no respect for the poor, and the Christians, instead of running after the culture and saying, we've got to be relevant, and if we look like the culture, they'll all come to us. That's the biggest lie that Satan tells. It's when you and I live as gracious men and women love everybody that God brings across our path, but stay the course in being men and women of biblical morality and theology. We might get criticized. We have extra biblical non-Christian historians who track uh, the views of how the Christians were viewed in the first, second, third, on up to the fourth century. It starts out, they make fun of them, they ridicule them, they think they're nuts. They think they're cannibals. They eat and drink the body and blood 
this Jesus. They think they're and they're persecuted. They're thrown in the arenas. By the way, they're not thrown in the arena for being Christians. They're thrown in the arena because they refuse to say there are many paths and many gods. You know, uh, the Romans said all you got to do is every day, along with all the other Roman citizens, is just throw a pinch of incense on the altar to Caesar and say, Kaiser est curios, Latin for Caesar's Lord. And you don't have to believe it. You can go like this. We don't care. We well, just got to do it. And the Christians were thrown in the arena because they said, no. Only Jesus is curious. Only Jesus is Lord. Is that what you really believe? Yep. So you're not going to have to do the pinch of it? No. You're going in the arena. Now that's going to change your mind, isn't it? No. And so Christians held hands in the arena and sang hymns as the lions came down upon them. So people thought they were crazy at first. But then they were like, well, we really respect these people. So you see it change, and they go, whoa, the Christians, they're really strange, but, but they don't cheat us in business. And they don't cheat on their wives. And they don't kill their kids. And back in those days, if you wanted a boy and you got a girl, well, you just took the little girl out on the highway outside of town, left her there beside the road to die. It was the Christians going out there and they'd pick up these babies and take them back and adopt them and raise them as their children. And over, this wasn't overnight, it was over centuries. Over the centuries, you see the secular view of Christians change. And you see a lot of Roman soldiers and citizens and slaves and the gamut start coming to Christ. Start coming to Christ. That's our role, that just, that's the pathetic role, I believe, we're to play in this current milieu, a cultural milieu that is heading totally away from God's best for human life. I want to close out by just lifting up uh, four things out of this first part of this prayer. And then next week, we're going to get into this scripture is one of the Old Testament lessons that we of my funeral uh, this, back at 317 through 19. I can't wait to you're gonna have to stop me from preaching in there next, <laughs> next Thursday. Um, I want to just make a comment, four comments, one on the power of God, one on the wrath of God, um, one on the reaction of Habakkuk to who God is, and then the plea of Habakkuk to God. Some things that I hope you take away from here about the power of God. Uh, some things that may or may not have come up in your small groups. God's power in Habakkuk's prayer. Uh, Habakkuk ex expresses this power. One of the ways he does so is he talks about God's brightness being the brightest of the brightness in the universe. The theological term for that, particularly in the Old Testament, is the Shekinah glory of God. We can't even begin to fathom um, what pure, unadulterated light is. Put on my scientist hat here. I've always been fascinated by, by physics. And really, all of existence, all of material existence now, thanks to Mr. Einstein, has, has looked at through the lens of light. E equals mc squared. Well, the, the C in there is the speed of light. <coughs> we don't know anything that is faster in the universe than light. And. Um, but the amazing thing about light is if you study it, what is it? Well, you can scientifically study it one way, and it looks like it's a wave. And different, different uh, brightness, of colors, of light, they have different wavelengths. But it also uh, is it, it looks like it's a particle. It, it, it's some, you can study it from another angle, and it looks like it's a particle. So, I mean, it, what is it? Is it a wave or a particle? Yes? Yeah. I think this is one of God's clues. Like, 
There's some things you're just not going to be able to figure out. And um, all of this theory of relativity, it was real simple. Life was, the universe looked pretty simple before Einstein came along. You had Newtonian physics. Gravity, everything here on Earth seems to respond or be uh, play out according to what we call uh, Newtonian physical laws, ones that we're familiar with. The temperature at which water boils. Um, but then you move outside of uh, you go into space and time physics, and Newtonian physics all breaks down. And uh, I mean, we know this for a fact. If I can take you and put you in a rocket ship and shoot you into outer space, and we have the capability with rocket engines to accelerate you toward the speed of light, everything that we know breaks down and changes, such as mass, E, energy, mass times the speed of light squared. What am I talking about? Well, if we had a scale on that rocket ship and we accelerated you toward the speed of light, and you were standing on that scale, and we could, it was recorded back on Earth how much you weighed, you would weigh tons, tons. The closer you got to the speed of light, your mass increased. Why? <laughs> we can do this with electron particles and centrifuges. It's mind boggling. Here's the other thing that blows your mind. If we said we're going to send you into outer space at speed of light or near it for six days, and you're up there in time, and you've got a calendar, and you've got your watch, and you're crossing off the days, at the end of six days on your calendar, you come back to Earth, you go, where have you been? It's been six years. It's been gone six years. No, no, no. I timed it. Time changes. This is back to where I said, you know, when you die, you go outside of time into eternity. All these things morph. And so uh, if you read Stephen Hawking's uh, The History of Time, actually, it's, it's not that hard, but physicists are on a quest. They're, they're holy grail is to bring Newtonian physics and space-time physics together. They, they think there's some holy, holy grail that's going to be. My theory is they ain't none. And it's God's way of saying, I'm, I'm going to confound the smartest, most brilliant scientists. You think you're going to figure this out? No way. And you're just going to be baffled until one day I return. And then, then we will know as we are known. But until then, I don't think there's any holy grail physics-wise they're going to find. But this brightness, uh, notice that compared to the brightness of God, it, it's a brightness that even the sun and the moon stand still. They're in awe. Uh, they are like a pale thing compared to the brightness. Remember Moses goes up on the, on the mount and comes down and his face is shining. He's, and he's not anywhere near the presence of God, like you and I will experience in eternity. But it's close enough that he's shining, and then it starts disappearing. Of course, first everybody thinks that's cool, and they're almost worshiping Moses because he's glowing. And then that starts fading, and so he puts a veil over his face so nobody will know that it's failing, fading, and everybody will still look up to him. Vanity and idolatry jump in right away. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things we don't talk enough about uh, and I try to, around Easter time especially, is to talk about these resurrection bodies that you and I are going to have. You know, if Christ was not physically raised from the dead with this corporal flesh and blood body that's you know, recognizable, you could eat, you could touch it, uh, and yet it was a body in many ways totally unlike his previous body in that he could appear and disappear. Um, apparently he could change his form. So there's a connection and disconnection. But the point I'm trying to make it is, make is this. The Bible tells us that Christ's resurrection body 
He's the first fruits of what will be in his trail, and that's us. And we will have bodies exactly like Christ. Now, why is that so important for eternity? Because when you and I are in eternity, we're going to be living in the unveiled, glorious presence of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this body you and I have right now, it would be like you and I in these bodies we have right now, being able to exist with a hydrogen bomb going off right at our feet. I mean, we'd be vaporizing in a second. Well, if we were in the presence, unveiled presence, of the glory of God, we'd be, we'd be zapped out of existence. Christ's resurrection body, it's already been tested. He's already taken our flesh into eternity, and that resurrection body will be the <coughs> only kind of body that you and I can have that will be able to stand in the unveiled glory of God. And I can't even imagine what that is all about, but it's far better than anything you and I can ever think of. Um, the wrath of God. We don't like hearing about that. It's uh, throughout Scripture. It's not an Old Testament thing. Jesus talks a lot about the wrath of God. He even displays it to some of the Pharisees. But it, we get hung up because we tend to uh, anthropomorphize God and extrapolate us onto God. So when you and I are wrathful, it's usually out of place. Uh, usually uh, our ego and pride are hooked into it. Um, oftentimes we're over the line and we overreact. Well, God does none of that. I mean, God's wrath is pure. And it's actually a part of his love. Do you really want a God that's okay about all the sin and evil and injustice perpetrated by humankind in the world? I don't want that kind of God. He just goes, oh, well, you know, those things happen. And just No, uh, God's a God of perfect justice. Everything will be brought to under his bar of perfect justice at the end of time. And uh, he will obliterate all sin and evil so that it can never again, and I don't know exactly how this works, but that's the promise of Scripture. Never again will there be a fall where any of us in eternity will ever replicate what Adam and Eve did. Uh, to do that, God is going to obliterate evil completely. That's a part of his wrath. It's a good thing. Um, Habakkuk's reaction to God, we've already talked about this, but it needs to be said again. Um, he has this healthy fear, not a pathological fear, this healthy, reverent awe of the mystery and the power of God. Let's you and I try to cultivate that. Jesus, one of the images of Jesus uh, in Revelation is a lion. Lion of Judah and lamb. You don't mess with lions. Lambs are so cute. You can cuddle with them. Oh, they stink. Um, you ever petted a sheep? It's another hand. A lamb. I'm not saying Jesus stinks. I'm just saying. But the Bible purposely uses the, the, the seemingly disparate uh, images of Christ. And we get the picture in Revelation of, you know, the lion will lay down with the lion. There'll be no more, you know, red, earth red of tooth and claw. Um, perfect harmony. And there's a perfect harmony between the lion of Judah and the lamb of God, who was slain before the foundation of the world. We want to separate them out. The hard thing, hard thing of faith is to keep them together. But that's authentic faith. You know, Hebrew words always have a double meaning. And the Hebrew word uh, for faith uh, also means uh, uh, mystery. And it, it, it doesn't all make sense right now. If it did, it wouldn't be faith anymore. It would be complete knowledge. But we know enough of Christ, who he is, that he has unconditional love for us, that we're able to trust him even as a lion. So um, cultivate that healthy fear of the Lord. I tell this story a lot. It helps me live with it. 
If you've never read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, the, the first book in that series, the children, Lucy and others, they're heading on his journey to meet Aslan. But they don't know who Aslan is. They don't know he's a lion. Aslan's a Christ figure in the Chronicles of Narnia. And they're staying with the beaver family uh, one night, and all the animals in Narnia talk. And so the beavers are telling Lucy and her siblings about Aslan, and Mrs. Beaver drops the line that he's a lion. And so Lucy kind of freaks out. He's a lion? I have no idea he's a lion. And she says, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver chimes in and says, safe? Who said anything about safe? He's a lion, I tell you. He's the lord of the wood, but he's good. So you, you got that great, he's a lion, but he's good. It's good. So that, that tension between so uh, the children approach Aslan from then on out with a healthy fear of the Lord. And then finally the, the plea of Habakkuk to God. What's he saying? Um, first he's upset that God doesn't seem to care, that Israel's going haywire and God's letting them, he's not going to punish them. And God says, hold on, I am, here's my plan. Babylon. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, that's that's not just. That's not fair. You're using somebody that's worse than we are to punish us. That would be the other way around. And but you see in Habakkuk's prayer here, this is all a lot of it is Exodus language. He's looking back, he's looking back at God's track record. And basically he's saying, Do it again. I know you're a God of justice. I know you're a God of salvation. Um, I know you're a God of grace. Do it again. Do it again. And I can't say that phrase without thinking of uh, Dwight L. Moody, who uh, was a great Christian back in the 19th century. Uh, Central Prayers in Baltimore, where I had the privilege of pastoring for 11 years, that church started in 1853. And uh, its first sanctuary is in the middle of downtown, and, and it burned. And they built another one a little bit. It's also in downtown. And uh, the church dwindled down to a handful of people. In 19, by 1949, the Presbyterians were ready to close the church. But a deacon in the church saw it was coming, so he left a legacy to the Presbytery of $16,000, and he said, Presbyterian can have it after he died. And so the Presbyterian can have this money if it will not close Central Presbyterian Church, but replant it. It has to bear the name Central Presbyterian Church. So the Presbyterian bought this dairy farm, which at that time was on the outskirts of Baltimore, which is now, that church really is central, like in the middle of the demographics. And they bought this and they replanted it and it, and it, and it boomed. But um, I got there and it was the 140. 40th anniversary of the church at about four years of So we decided to have a service. So we decided to partner with the uh, Pentecostal church that had the, our old sanctuary downtown. We had this service, and I did the research, and I found out that when they dedicated that church building in 1871 or something, they had as their guest preacher Dwight L. Moody. So I started doing some research on him. I was trying to find the sermon he preached that day of the rededication of Central Press, but I couldn't find the sermon, but uh, I did preach one of his sermons as if I was quite a moody, except he weighed like 380 pounds. But, um, all this to say, quite uh, a moody came to Christ sitting in a, in, in a church service. He wasn't a Christian. Somebody invited him to church. And it's there's a plaque marking that spot in that church in Chicago. And somebody one time went, this is back in the 19th century, and after he'd become a famous, he was the most famous evangelist of the 19th century. He was the Billy Graham of that era. And somebody wanted to go see that, so they went there and asked a custodian where the plaque was. He said, well, it's in that like, third pew over there from the front. And as the person tried to I don't know, there's only one person in the sanctuary that was sitting in that spot where that plaque was. 
So they're like, oh, brother. And so they kind of go to the pew behind uh, this person figure, well, pretty soon they'll get up and leave, and then I can go see this black. And they're sitting there and sitting there, and the person is bent over praying. And they're like, where is this person going to quit? Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, the person behind the person praying gets curious and starts leaning forward to see what are they praying about. And it's a man, he's praying, and he starts he's mumbling in his breath, under his breath, Lord, do it again. Please do it again. Please do it again. What is this guy praying? Finally, the man praying quits, stands up. It's Dwight L. Moody. Huh? And he walks out of the sanctuary. Do it again, Lord. Where did you come to Christ? When did you come to Christ? How was it? What did God do in your life? Those nights, those dark nights of the soul, the wilderness times you go through in your life, those are the times we pray like a back. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. And the good news of the gospel, you will. You will. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for a backup. We thank you that you're a God who has a long track record and we can trust you. Uh, we thank you that you're a God that does it again, that listens to our prayers. And your, the trajectory of salvation in our lives is assured. And so with the backup, we give you thanks for your power, even your wrath, but most of all for your grace, ultimately displayed through Jesus Christ our Lord.